here. Thank you, Janet. Let me just, I uh, want to make sure this thing is working. Uh, oh, good, it's working. All right. Um, uh, the first thing I wanted to say is good morning. And uh, also, uh, it's, it is an honor to be here. You know, you're funders, so people tell you that all the time. Um, <laughs> I really should start off by insulting you. I really would get your attention. And the fact of the matter is, and I'll get serious in a minute, but we had a, one of these thought leader forums about five or six years ago, seven years ago in Baltimore. And one of the presenters was the vice president of the American Federation of Teachers, David Sherman. And he started off his thought leader presentation by basically telling everyone in the room off. And it was amazing how everybody's eyes lit up. All of a sudden, all the, folk, all the funders were focused on David. They were like, you know, they're on their iPods, they're on their iPads, and all of a sudden he's saying, you know, I don't think very much of all of you. And everybody perked up. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> what I will tell you is it is an honor to be here. And the reason it's an honor is because it's, it's an honor to, to be with people who care about kids and are trying to make a difference um, in what is not an easy field and not an easy endeavor who are trying to make the world a better place for children and thus make the world a better place overall. So that is, for me, um, a real honor. And um, I hope that I'll have something valuable to share. Now, now before I get serious, I have one last thing to say. I, I, you know, after I became friends with Daniel Wyndham, I thought, I really want to be like Daniel Wyndham when I grow up. Now, I realize that I can't be Daniel Wyndham when I grow up. However, I can dress just like him. <laughs> <laughs> So if you take, so stand up, Daniel. <laughs> so I would say my great achievement for the day is that uh, while I can never be Daniel Wyndham, although I will always keep trying, I can certainly dress almost exactly as Daniel. So now let's get on to some business here. This report. One, we have an hour. Now, we've li you know, a little less than an hour after a couple of jokes. It's always good to get people laughing a little bit to start off, especially with a serious topic, a deadly serious topic. Um, I would say um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the report, but we're going to pivot from the report fairly uh, early. But I um, and you'll see the pivot. Um, Janet initially asked me to do a policy analysis of the report, and I started to work on the report from a policy perspective. There really isn't enough in it. It's not, to, it's not that I'm criticizing the report. The report is essentially a scan, and it doesn't get deep enough into data to really go into what I would consider to be a, um, a, the kind of policy analysis that I would want to do and be able to bring to you. So we will, however, touch upon a couple of highlights, and we're going to use the report as a launching pad. So keep going. Now you see you have this actually <laughs> right in front of you. <laughs> so. Um, so ultimately what I'm doing is I'm reflecting on the report. Um, I spent some time thinking about it, looking at the data, and started wondering what is this report saying and what doesn't the report say. Um, and that's basically how I'd like to use this. It's really, it's really a reflective exercise. And I would like to be able to get to conversation as quickly as we can. We have the time to do it. I won't present the entire time even though um, brevity has never been my strong suit for those who know me, but we want, I definitely want to get to some conversations and I hope that we'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to provoke some, some things. So a little bit of the methodology, Janet really gave it to you. Um, it's not the entire realm, but basically you can see that it, um, they did go over all the grants that they had in the sets between 1999 and 2012. Um, and they're really roughly looking at half the dollars. They don't make any differentiation programmatically between in school and out of school. Um, they do break down capital versus other types of funding. Um, nevertheless, there are certainly things to gain, but you cannot look at, look, you cannot look at this from a comprehensive standpoint. Again, nevertheless, there are important things here. Right off the bat, as we start to get into reflection, I think it is important to look basically at how they defined arts education grant making. And um, this is an editorial um, piece right here. So I, um, I italicized and bolded that because I thought it was particularly interesting in light of our topic for today. So they're defining, um, it's interesting, in a way they're defining advocacy, if we take out effectiveness, um, in terms of expanding and enhancing its influence. And as someone who really veered into the advocacy world, I felt that that was right out of the gate, um, not really a sufficient definition of advocacy. Um, and you can also see, I also felt in a way in the framing 
of arts education that in fact policy and advocacy were really kind of absent. They were touched upon a little bit, but this really sort of gives it to you. I think this really tells you right up front where the report, the perspective of the report writers. Um, and in a way, this was kind of a search for advocacy and policy. So this gives you some sense. The, the key issue is there was a rise of spending in the grants they looked at of 57% between 1999 and 2012 from 193 rough odd million to 304 million. And the rate of growth was slower than the rate of growth in overall foundation given, giving. And um, as you can see, the total share of arts education funding within arts funding remained steady at 14%. Um, this starts to give you a little bit, this starts to give, this is an interesting issue because it actually gives you the sweep of funding during this period. And you see what happens after the 2008 fall off. And that um, while we're recovering, um, as of 2012, we still have not gotten back. And I think it will be an interesting question as to whether we get back or not. And there is a, pol there is a policy piece in this. I think my, my gut on, and whether we want to return to whatever number may be meaningless to some degree, but I do think what's happening is the funding needs are diversifying. We saw over a period of time, you're, you're taking a look at the, the continued growth of charter movement. You're taking a look at continued growth of Teach for America. What's happening is the, the, the nature of funding is, diver has di is increasing in its diversification. And as the sort of disruption to the to traditional school systems continues, I think what you're going to continue to see is foundations that might have put a lot more money into arts education strictly, dividing it up in, in very different kinds of ways. And it's not just foundations, it's government funding. If you take a look at things like um, major, the major uh, USDOE initiatives, um, the biggest grants went to places like Teach for America. So the, the nature of funding and the nature of practice is changing. And it will be interesting to see how these things play out. And that does speak to the importance of the report um, overall and why these kinds of reports, in terms of them being scans, are important. This is another interesting piece. Again, so in a reflection, what are the kinds of things that caught my eye? Now, you have to realize they're not differentiating between K-12 and higher education. So right off the bat, it looks impressive. You take a look at $18 million, $16 million, and $9.1 million. I didn't get into Windgate, um, but the top three don't fund K-12. The top three, uh, Mellon, doesn't, Mellon was precluded uh, until the recent uh, new strategic plan of last year from funding K-12, and they're still hardly funding, even with it being opened up in the strategic plan. Uh, Robino, it was a grant to Yale, uh, basically, and Karsh, the vast majority of the money went to, um, was a higher ed grant, um, and it funded, uh, a lot of it actually funded a jazz loft project. So even when you take a look at this, um, you have to start, you, you start to look for where's K-12. You start to look again because they didn't differentiate. And, um, and, it, and the pie starts to shift right off the bat. And you know, you, some of you know these foundations. So it's, this is what I mean by there wasn't enough in the data um, to, you know, or I, could, I really didn't have the time to delve into every one of the, let's say, top 20 grants. But, and, but nevertheless, it's an interesting thing to look at to see who's giving what, where those numbers are, who gives to K-12, and of course it's an interesting question as to what they give in the K-12 realm. And there you start to see the numbers total up from the subtotals to all other foundations, and that's when you get to $304 million. Um, they also, um, and you can see they do indicate whether it's independent, corporate, community. Um, and these are also, again, these are grants of $10,000 or more. Grant range was a little bit interesting, too. Um, this is a capital. And um, you can take a look at where the capital grants go. And that's not surprising. Makes a lot of sense. Capital grants tend to be larger. Um, they're bricks and mortar. For the most part, they could be endowment. Um, then you now you take a look at all of the support and you start to see it shifts tremendously from capital certainly and you start to see that um, the majority of the grants here are under $25,000 um, and that's held steady from essentially roughly speaking this is held fairly steady from 1999 into 2012 this this begins to there's there's earmarks here fingerprints of how funders are operating what kinds of things they're funding how much they're funding what the grant size is um, and also, 
the continuity over a, over a just decent longitudinal period from 1999 to 2012. In some ways, it's an interesting reflection, I think, for you as you start to think of what do you do, what do your colleagues do, what's the practice. This tells you where the numbers are. Um, but vast majority of it goes into uh, music within performing arts. Um, and, it start, and this is also interesting. It's, but, uh, and maybe, I don't know where. It is interesting. So where's advocacy? Well, I'm not sure, actually. And I didn't have the time to really get into it, because it would have taken a lot of research to find that out. But if you're looking for advocacy policy, you can see you don't find it in these documents. Um, you don't find it in the data. Um, but you also see this gives you, again, the shape of the field. I think it's been this way for a long time. Um, so let's keep going. Again, it gets a little bit more detailed here. In separating out capital from all other support, total amount, number of grants. Again, you see music organizations within performing arts. You see the sort of hierarchy of where funding goes. And again, remember, this is not differentiated K-12 from higher education. This is the total grants in the, in the data set. These are the key findings. This is where I get to make a crack. Um, I was, I, you know, I thought it was interesting. The key findings were really, these were the key findings, literally. I did, uh, I, I did put the key findings in quotes. It's the, the key findings were relatively light. And it gives you a sense of why there, there wasn't that much to work on. It's, it's certainly important to note the growth in uh, support, 57%. Um, but there's not a lot, of, a lot here. And what does it say when a majority of arts education grants targeted children and youth? Um, it, would, it could be an interesting project, and maybe the next time around, to get into more detail. I think an, a deeper data dive could be fascinating on this. We unfortunately, within the, within, for the purposes of today, we were not able to really do that. So looking forward, the report's conclusion in a way, the, and I've bolded the, con the real conclusion. Essentially, the concern that the, por the, the report raised was the question of what's going to happen with generational shifts and the ways in which arguments have been made. Um, and will it be possible to sustain donor support? Um, I, they really didn't, they, it, was a, it was a very much, it was a sort of broad-based statement. It could go to um, donor-advised funds. It could go to program directors. It could go to boards of foundations. It could go to government. Um, but they raised the concern about, and I think it's a valid concern, and it relates earlier to what I talked about in the shifting, the diversification of funding, particularly within the public education realm. You know, 15 years ago, there weren't charter schools. And I'm not making a statement for or against charter schools. But if you take a look at the changing landscape, if you take a look at outsourcing, privatization, um, what happens is you are really looking at something that has um, diversified in significant ways. Um, and when you take a look at the um, funders who have gravitated to charter schools, it, 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 it is an interesting issue as to where funders will come from, how the case will be made, what the argument is, what the appeal is. And I think what they're essentially saying is that the traditional historical, historic appeal, um, even though it's improved over time, that you know, sometimes it's been very instrumental about the imp raising test scores. Other times it's been about um, humanistic issues, community-based issues. It could be um, diversity issues. But that the ways in which arguments have been made over the last 20 years may be insufficient um, as this continued change a change in the world, actually. It's a change in almost everything we know. Is it, this area, your field cannot remain um, immune to that sort of change. But that was really the sort of big, when, they, when, they, when the writers were asked, when the writers got to that point where you reflect on the data, that was um, centrally what they reflected. Now, I, this is where we start to shift a little bit. I think it's really fascinating to take a look at this diagram to take a look at this pie chart. So K-12 arts education, where does the money come from? And 80, so almost, you know, heading towards 90% of it is coming from government. And right then and there, I think if I were a funder, which I'm not, I was um, a type of a funder for many at the Center for Arts Education, a, a re-grantor, grant maker. If I were a funder, I would look at that and it raises really interesting questions about the levers. 
what can your money do? Where, where is the, where, what, are, what are the economics of our schools? And when you start to think strategically and tactically about what you fund and where you fund it, I think that this chart sort of flips everything on its head, in my view, as I started to reflect. I was thinking to myself, what can I put up there right after the report that'll really start to get you thinking um, in a profoundly different way? And I may not be bringing anything to you that you don't, haven't known before, that even if you know it before, I think when you see it in front of your face like this, it's pretty profound. So let's now go to something from a 2010 report by the National Committee for Responsible Philanthropy. Um, they basically uh, challenged grant makers to provide at least 50% of their grant dollars to benefit marginalized groups and to provide at least 25% of their grant dollars for advocacy, organizing, and civic engagement to promote equity, opportunity, and justice. And yes, I realize I'm breaking the cardinal, what's become a cardinal rule of PowerPoint. You really shouldn't put narrative up there and read from it. But I am nevertheless, um, there's sometimes that's not a bad thing to do, especially when you want to underscore something particularly important. So if you're not listening to me, at least you're reading it, um, <laughs> is the subtext to that statement. It's, I think that this starts to also shift into, for me, of a, in, again, in terms of a reflection. Very interesting issue of um, how do you diversify your portfolio as a funder? And I think that's what the statement is. So we have 25%. You know, the, we take a look at this scan and policy and advocacy. It's not that policy and advocacy aren't in there. You could find them if you start to get into deeper levels of data analysis. But in the report as it's constructed, you really can't find it. And not only can't you find it, the description that's given in, in essence in a glossary um, uh, of the report doesn't adequately d describe it. Um, and here you have a very interesting uh, group of funders basically saying you need to think about your portfolios. You need, to, you need to take some of your money and you need to put it into this. So um, moving, uh, you know, there's a very interesting piece and in Atlantic had produced a number of pieces, but this was a big one for me when I was at the Center for Arts Education. They came out with a pretty big and bold piece about why advocacy number of case studies. And it really was, in my view, a call to the funding field, uh, to, fil to the philanthropic sector, um, to, to reconsider the role of advocacy, to reconsider the role of policy. Um, and I think that Gary LaMarche, who is no longer at Atlantic, he's since retired, and I forget where he is now. Um, but it's a very interesting statement. Again, um, and this is one of your own, head of a foundation at that point in time. He was also prior to that was at Open Societies. I knew him there. Um, so you start to see this sort of issue. You think to yourself, 80% of the money is flowing from government. You start to hear, what do we, where are we get, what dial are we going to move? We can never replace through direct funding. We can, you, we're dwarfed. If you want to direct fund something in a school district, your money's going to be dwarfed. You can pull it all together. You're never going to come, you know, the New York City school system, I think, at this point has near a $25 billion budget for something, 1.2 million, million students. The philanthropic community in New York can't, yes, it's true, if a, a number of hedge fund uh, guys decided to put, a, they could probably match it for a couple of years if they wanted to, but that doesn't seem to be happening. But you need to be really, I think, reckoning with these things. It's it is the lay of the land. And now I want to talk about, and you can see I'm heading towards return on investment. I want to talk about two organizations. Return on investment um, as a way of, say, pro provoking the question of how do you diversify a portfolio? What do you carve out? How do you support this area? And have you supported it? And I think I skipped a slide. But anyway, um, I could swear there was another slide in there. But we'll see. I maybe I haven't come to it yet. I haven't had enough coffee. Um, so this is a very interesting organization, and I think in some ways they, uh, well, I should say that first of all, the Joe Landon who runs it is a dear friend of mine, and someone I also admire, although I don't try to dress like him. Uh, <laughs> and if you know Joe Landon, you would know why. So um, <laughs> oh, I hope you'll delete that section from this <laughs> So basically, um, he plays guitar very well, however. So I think that what we've seen historically is the organizations that really take on policy and advocacy have been underfunded. Um, if you take a look at the Kennedy Center Network, what happened eventually with it and its withering, um, these organizations have been starved for resources. And this is a great example. 
Not to, um, not to uh, criticize some of the foundations here who have been uh, great supporters of the California Alliance, including those who have served on the board or served as chair of the board. Uh, I'm looking at one of them right now. Um, but take, you know, let's, so they've got four staff people. It's not very much. They have total revenues of 2012 of $532,000. And Joe Landon and his staff plugged away at a number of issues. They've done, a, I'm just picking one. But let's look at return on investment and why some money should be dedicated to this area. This is hardcore policy and advocacy. Joe Landon spending his time on policy, to understand policies, to analyze those policies, to go from person to person to figure out how you move the dial, how you, who the stakeholders are, how you make the case. You've got to know this stuff. You have to have expertise. It is not, we do not have a field with a surfeit of this type of expertise. We have never had it. Um, it's actually, the people who know this stuff inside out are kind of like freaks in this field. Um, and that's a huge problem, actually, because the other fields have it. Uh, grant makers for education, you can look at any number of organizations, they have it. Heavy education funders in philanthropy, they have it sometimes within their foundations. You have people like um, Fred Freelow at Ford. They're experts in policy. He's an expert on the economics of school districts. So. You've got Joe Landon acquiring this information, really sort of like Johnny Appleseed, just plugging away. And he's able to clarify what was a longstanding question about the use of Title I monies in the state of California for arts education. And he was able to clarify it in a way, and there have been other instances in other states, and there have been there, uh, you know, X number of years before, Arne Duncan did issue a letter, but it still wasn't clarified, that opened up in the state of California, the, in a formal manner, opened the gates to arts education being fully considered for funding within Title I. It opened up $1.6 billion of funding, arts education, into that door, a, a $532,000 organization with four people scraping by, opened up. That's, we want to talk, have you ever seen a return on investment like that? You tell me, who's seen it? Where, where do you have return on investment like that? Is it easy? How, when do the winds come along? It's, it's complicated stuff. It's not the easiest thing to explain sometimes. But I think this is to be reckoned with. And I think that the real point here is that this is an underfunded organization. This is an, or, you know, so yes, you could say, wow, look what they've done with their funding. Why should we give them any more? I hope none of you will think that. <laughs> One of the most efficient organizations I've ever seen, but you can imagine, what if, what if more money was put into it? What if the organization was really made whole? And in my career, I've seen most of these organizations go down the tubes. Janet should jump in. She ran one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they really, they have... So did Margaret Absolutely. These organizations, a lot of them have gone out of business, or they've been hand to mouth in the most extraordinary ways um, because this field funds programs. So let's look at another one. Now, um, disclaimer, I helped found this organization when I was a consultant to the Annenberg School Reform Initiative. And then, I don't know what it was, uh, eight years after it had started, I then became executive director. And um, it's, it is an interesting issue. This was, the organization was at one point the large, during the Annenberg, the peak Annenberg challenge years, it was the largest funder of arts education in the city of New York. It also, um, at its peak was, was an intermediary or an educational management in institution for 130 schools partnered with 400 cultural organizations and partners from the higher education sector. Um, and it had some tremendous wins, um, but one way or the other, the organization, the Annenberg monies went away because it had been sold as a short-term solution of five, the Annenberg, the, and a challenge, the 500 million that went to 18 organizations was billed as a five-year project. Annenberg didn't want to fund more than five years. And, um, uh, you know, a five-year project. Uh, so anyway, long story short, CAE has shifted. It, there's two pieces to this I think are interesting. One is the organization's board and leadership at the time, it happened to be me, um, felt that the, in order to make good on the mission, the mission was to ensure that every child in the New York City public schools has access to quality arts education. And there was a point in strategic planning when one of the board members asked, um, asked he said, what does it mean every child? He, it, and the point was made, um, if it's more children, we could be programmatic. But if it's every child, and our mission was explicit, if it's every child, what does that 
what are the implications of that for our actions? And the, the consensus was at that point that the only way that you could do something for every child was to um, move away from programmatic work and into policy and advocacy work. And we did make that shift. However, CAE could never survive in New York today on, only the, on the support that is provided for advocacy and policy. And we were forced to, I think ultimately it was the right thing, we were forced to create a hybrid between programs, policy, and advocacy. A lot of people said you, could, you couldn't and shouldn't do that. Um, so they're running all kinds of things. Some of the programs they've run for years, it still has a giant uh, parent partnership program. They have had um, USDOE grants. But they, we had to do the programmatic work, and they, they actually created a core of teaching artists, which people were particularly outraged about. Um, you can imagine, this was an intermediary organization designed to fund others and organize others, and all of a sudden it's doing direct programs. It could not have survived otherwise. So in its budget, which is much smaller overall than it once was during the Annenberg years, um, basically, you have, you have, again, it's not that, it's close to the California Alliance. You have $350,000 going to advocacy and policy. The, the center, in its work over a number of years, developed significant relationships statewide and citywide, developing campaigns, um, doing research, um, working with the elected officials, running government affairs breakfasts, developing partnerships. It was able to withstand um, a rather rough ride with the Bloomberg administration to, to have a new administration come in and a new city council come in, basically where relationships had been developed over years. It was seen, the organization was seen as, I think, an honest advocate, a great source of information, and a partner to elected officials. And it was, as uh, Bill de Blasio became mayor, and Mark Viverito became the city council speaker, it was able to have $23 million a year baselined in the city budget for four straight years for a total of $92 million. Now, it should be noted that this is only about a third of what, um, prior to the Bloomberg administration, there was a dedicated fund, a categorical funding line of $75 million a year that the center had helped develop in the mid-90s, which the Bloomberg administration um, essentially eliminated. It was part of what turned CAE into an advocate. But the work that they did, bang for the buck, you have, they're basically, they've got $350,000. They have more staff, and they have a dedicated policy person, but they, were, they secured $92 million. Now granted, it's a giant budget, but still, when you take a look at return on investment, and you also realize if th that this organization could not survive on the support it is receiving for advocacy and policy, as important as that support is. And I think that in terms of return on investment, and I think in terms of thinking about portfolio um, allocation, as the Council for Responsible Philanthropy recommended, I think, this, I think it starts to create a very interesting framework to be thinking about. This is the one I thought I forgot. So, you know, let's, let's go from, for one minute, see how we're doing time-wise. I'll close, I'll um, open this up in a second. It's so interesting to go from the definition, how the report defines advocacy and policy, to how, to the elements. So it's that one thing, in, increase influence. So let's break open increase influence and let's take a look at the elements of advocacy, organizing, education of legislature, um, educating the public, research, rallies, regulatory efforts, public education. It's a big, rich field that we have been slow to the table on. It's a formal field. Um, there are many nationals doing it, and we have people here. We have Narek Rome, we have Heather Noonan. Um, but the issue, you know, politics is local. Um, you need it on a national basis. You have the efforts that, that many of you are funding here and Grant Makers in the Arts and, Penn, and the work of Penn Hill. Um, but when you think of local organizations and you think who's funding what, where, what capacities do we have? And then you start to take a look at this. One of my um, bullets went over to the side. Um, and then you get into the areas that are really, these last two pieces are where people start to become uncomfortable. And it's the litigation and it's the lobbyists. When I left my job at CAE, I had been a registered lobbyist for two years, which is kind of weird. Um, but we were on the floor of the city council um, trying to get people to sign letters and we had to register law in the city and state as lobbyists. And we were helping to craft legislation. We were working with the Board of Regents. Um, we had the expertise when the Board of Regents of the state of New York, <laughs> Gesundheit, came to us wanting to know, can you help, help us with a task force we're creating within the Regents 
to look at arts education. They came to us because they knew we had the expertise to work behind the scenes for them. Again, that's enough, these things are all critical. Who's out there? Who do you have that knows this work, that understands it, that can be go-to on the local level? And what is, it pos what is it possible to achieve? Now, I would also say, don't get me wrong. I, I do believe, I had a friend once who said to me, policy is money, and I won't deny that. But I'm, I also don't want you to think that I'm overlooking um, the richness and the diversified importance of the field and so many things that all of you fund and so many things the field does. But it really is interesting to look at. Litigation, there's been almost zero. I think we heard recently of one instance um, through the um, Funders uh, Coalition in Grantmakers in the Arts of one uh, locale that was looking at litigation. There's been no litigation that I know of around arts education. There have been all sorts of instances of litigation in public education, particularly around funding formulas. Um, we considered it at the Center for Arts Education. We thought about it really carefully, and, and I'm sorry we didn't uh, do it. We actually had talked to the New York Civil Liberties Union, and they, uh, they eventually came around to saying they were, they were interested. And um, I think that everybody sort of chickened out to be, I uh, hope you delete that too. And, um, I do think in hindsight that we could have achieved more. I think we could have had a conversation with the Bloomberg administration and the conversation might have been, what do you want from us? That, that litigation would have caused. Um, and if NYCLU had done it, we could have afforded to do it, but we didn't. It's been an interesting piece. But, um, so these are, this is an interesting to go from expanding influence into what are the components of advocacy. I think it's important. These are things that I think are important for you to ask yourselves as well as for your partners in crime to be asking themselves, what, what, how can you get more involved? What do you do? And I think that, you know, for me, this is one of the most important pieces. You're thinking about your mission, thinking about your goal, I think mean, it could be a little trickier in a larger foundation. The goal, in larger the foundation, I think the less specific the goals tend to be. But when you start to ask yourself, you start to look at your mission, and in terms of mission-driven, you ask yourself, what is your mission telling us? What is, and what is your heart telling you? That's what we found in that meeting that Janet was talking about. When we asked people what they did, they were funding programmatic efforts. When we asked them what they wanted, they wanted every kid to have arts education. Their dream and their hope was for that. And you saw this sort of disconnect. So it's a really interesting thing to ask you, what's your mission? There's a lot of organizations with a mission that's very much a policy mission. It's about every kid. There's all sorts of stuff. It's about improving. It's about, but so I think that that, in terms of pure form and best practice in running and managing organizations is really critical to ask yourself, what, is, what does our mission tell us about policy and advocacy? Now, I wanted to sort of close off by saying, the field is so beautiful and evolving. I've been at it, unfortunately, longer than I would like to admit. Um, and I've been watching it, you know, and it's so interesting, too, to uh, talk about Daniel Windham one more time. You have um, a colleague here who ran one of the first uh, coordinated partnerships in any city. He ran Arts Partners in Kansas City. That was like the first. I'm, I was relatively young in my career. That was a groundbreaking thing. Nobody had ever thought about anything like it. Um, it predated all these kinds of things. So it, this stuff's been going on. It's been evolving. We've been learning. Big thought, the LA work, um, what's going on in Chicago. You've, you've got white papers on this. Some of these things have come and gone. Some of these things are coming back. The field continues to grow. <laughs> You've got the teaching artist piece evolving, the divergent models, not only uh, all kinds of system-wide, field-wide support, exemplary partnerships with districts, non-exemplary partnerships with districts. You've got, um, you've got in-school, out-of-school, and community-based merging in all sorts of interesting ways. I think, the pre I think that pre-service is improving. Pre-service was really problematic for many years in non-arts teachers receiving no arts training um, as they were learning to be um, teachers. I think that um, professional development and, of course, the enduring models um, and, the endur and enduring all these things, the turnover of elected officials, the downturns, the policy churn, district leadership, musical chairs, 50% of teachers resigning within the first five years. We don't even have to get into um, the percentage of school leaders resigning, and not only if you really want to get into it, the district superintendents that resign. Um, the multidisciplinarity that continues to grow, the new standards that are being brought online nationally, you're also looking at them in various states. Assessment, longitudinal research, the growth in family. The field is maturing, the field has gotten bigger. In some ways it makes it more difficult to fund actually. I think there's more beauty and there's more opportunity, but let's not forget about advocacy policy. 
So, so this is the how I'm going to close off. I think the weak link does remain advocacy, policy, data, real strength and agency, organizational agency and individual agencies, expertise. And again, we have some people here, Bob Morrison. We have Heather. We have Narek. There may be others that I'm overlooking who have incredible expertise in this area. That needs to grow. People need to, un that needs to grow significantly. I would almost argue that it's an opportunity for higher education, but that's another <laughs> thought leader forum. Um, I think that, um, again, you know, pr this is something I came to. Programs are not policy. They're just not. Um, they're practice. And there are times where the two conflate, but, but really at a DNA level, program is a program. And, and, they are, and the idea that you're going to do a program and that somehow you think that this is going to get you to um, equity, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, I think this issue of if you're operating within the margins of the economics of a school district, and go back to that first pie chart, if you're operating on the margins, that means that the ways in which you think about things strategically and tactically have to be extremely thoughtful and extremely careful. Where are, how are you going to move the dial with that money um, is really a critical thing because 87% of the money comes from government. So how are you going to get government to spend more is kind of basically the question in a way. Or redistribute. There's a lot of stuff being done. So, and then I would say the last thing, I think the field still is kind of screwed up. Um, and most recently, I thought the, um, the what used to be known as MENC, the National Association for Music Educators, basically making the pitch on the Hill um, to have music designated as a core subject, um, enumerated separately from the other art forms. I dealt with a lot of this in New York State when I was at the center. It was, it was specific discipline-based advocacy that basically said, we really don't care about the other art forms. We're going to get it for this discipline, and the rest of you can go to hell. Um, I know it's a hard field, but I think that these things are, pr are problematic, and I have no problem calling people out because I have nothing to lose at this point. <laughs> I'm not really working in this field anymore. Um, so that's my presentation. So I, did I provoke something, anything? You guys have something to say? What I, think that, what I think happens is I think there's so much of the practice in the field has been guided by programmatic thinking. Um, and there are major exceptions. But the programmatic thinking tends to be a slice in time. So programmatic is sort of year by year. And there's reporting. There's a whole, there's, there's um, physical issues to this. There's reporting issues to this. I understand that. But I think what happens is the, there's the nature of the work. And the nature of the work is long term. Um, and it's such, so policy advocacy. So you're exactly right. So what are you going to do on a regulatory basis? Um, one of the, and, and so you're right. Even, so one, even you get this, what do you do next? You know, why was the benefit of being in New York and also the tragedy of it was um, New York had very, very clear, has very, very clear laws. The, the, actually, the chancellor's, um, the chancellor's regulations that come from the Board of Regents are actually are the equivalent of state law. It's written into the New York State Constitution. And it is very, very clear that you cannot get a high school diploma without a year of arts. I won't get into the detail of how the arts break down. And you cannot get that middle school diploma without a year of the arts. And they can only be provided by certified teachers because it must be a teacher of record. Um, and this stuff's not being enforced. We worked very hard for a long time to, you know, we were sitting with the, cha uh, with the chancellor of the Board of Regents, commissioner of the state education department. We, um, very, very hard stuff. That's when we started to think about lawsuits. Um, is even the issue of, in advocacy and policy work, if you think about the sort of the, the axiom of um, sometimes a loss is a win. And if you really think about that, up against the sort of way of funding programs, a loss in programs is usually not a win. A loss in programs is a program that sort of fails. Um, a, a loss in programs almost often means that um, you are not going to, you're going to decline. There'll be a declination of funding in the next application. There are always exceptions. But the idea that it didn't really work out, you didn't hit most of your goals, there's probably not a ton of grantees that are giving you reports like that. Um, whether it's true or not is an interesting question. <laughs> but um, so you have a policy, and this is where the policy works interesting. You know, you might have, you might need that loss because that loss is going to create energy. That loss is going to bring people to you. And then you need to, and, and you start to think of it, and there's a longitudinal nature to it that you have to be able to put your head around. And it gets to Daniel's question. It's a very, very different way of looking at investing um, in educational improvement. Um, so it's critical. And I do, 
I, you know, I, I would love to see somebody sue somebody <laughs> for uh, not giving arts education. I would love to see what the f how it would play out. What would happen? What will be the tales? Will it be so bad? Will people lose their jobs? Will organizations go out of business? What really will happen? What will be won? What would be lost? I'd love to see it. And of course, I do recognize that one of the most heralded cases in this, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity in New York State, which got billions of dollars awarded by the court, has never been able to fully recover the money. So I understand that too. But what, so, and sometimes, uh, you see what I mean? There's an inside out, wins can be losses and losses can be wins. But um, if you can't, what I would say, I know Janet's standing there, that means it's time to stop. So what I would say again, uh, in a way you want to take that 87%. I really should have done a chart where I took the 87% of funding and I should have turned it into a bullseye. And it should be a bullseye that you can print and you make, you know, you could do a 3D printing, make it into a target, and you could put it on the back of your door. And every day you could look at that 87% of funding and ask yourself, what are you doing? How are you hitting the 87? What dart have you thrown at the 87%? to make it do something for you, to make it fund something that only it can fund. What are you doing? What are you going to do? That's the name of the game. It just is. We've been around this long enough. Um, I'll stop now, because Dan is like, I know that technique. <laughs> 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 You're very welcome.